Welcome back to Shannon's Lumber Industry Update. It's episode 36, and this episode is the first of a multi-part episode where we're talking about plywood. I could call all these episodes together Plywood 101, and really this is inspired by a session I did for apprentices at the Hand Tool School. In case you don't know, because I don't really talk about it very much, I run an online woodworking school called the Hand Tool School. We focus on hand tools and hand tool techniques. And I have a, a membership level there called apprenticeship. And every month I do an office hour session is what I call it. And this month we focused on plywood. I had some questions from members about buying plywood and about what to look for in plywood. So I put together kind of a, a comprehensive plywood 101 lecture, if you will, and um, presented this and had lots of visual aids and lots of different types of plywood. And it occurred to me while I was doing this that it really should also translate over to this podcast. I've talked about plywood in the past, but in very specific things, I talked about it with regulations and TOSCA compliance, TOSCA Title VI, that's the Toxic Substance Control Act. But I really haven't taken a step back and talked about plywood in general and the various facets of plywood, how to buy plywood and how is plywood constructed? Because I firmly believe having a strong understanding of how it's constructed and all of the different components that come together to equal a panel will really help you understand how to buy it. So over the next few episodes, we're gonna break it down. We're gonna talk about face veneers. We're gonna talk about the cores, the types of cores and how they're constructed. We're gonna talk about the types of glues and the manufacture process. But more importantly, we're gonna talk about how you should go about buying plywood. And that's really the focus of today's episode. But before we dive into that, I do wanna say thank you to all of my new patrons. I've had quite a few new folks come in at the $1 and $2 level. Every little bit helps. Uh, The show continues to grow, and I love seeing the sponsorship and the interest in it. I'm getting lots of messages from you guys, lots of emails, lots of questions, and it's just great to hear that this show is really resonating with a lot of you. For such a long time, I've thought no one would really be interested in kind of the ins and outs of the lumber industry, and beyond, you know, a few basic how to buy lumber type stuff, people wouldn't really be interested in some of the other inside baseball type things, but I am wrong. And I keep getting lots and lots of feedback about um, how much people are enjoying the show. So again, thank you for being a patron. Thank you for sponsoring the show. But most importantly, just thank you for the feedback that you're enjoying what's going on. So if you are interested in just showing a little bit of support for the show, you can go to patreon.com slash lumber update and everything you need to know there. A dollar, five dollars, eight dollars, I don't care. Whatever you want to sponsor, I certainly appreciate it. And when it comes to questions, certainly over the next at least, I would say, three episodes, including this one, maybe four, we're going to be talking plywood. So by all means, send in your plywood questions. And if you go to lumberupdate.com, Dot com. You'll find a contact form there where you can submit questions, or you can record a voice memo, if you will, and email it to me at lumberupdate at gmail.com. Of course, you can also find me on Instagram. I'm lumberupdate there as well. Um, lots of ways to get in touch with me, and I definitely want to hear your questions. What I may even do is dedicate one of the episodes of this multi-part Plywood 101 series to your actual questions. So please, get them into me. I, I love answering them. So without further ado... Let's start talking plywood, specifically how you go about buying plywood. Now, um, at the the J. Gibson McElvain Lumber uh, blog, I've talked quite a bit about plywood. And one of the kind of overriding themes is let price be your guide. And that's, I know that can be a little difficult because a lot of times people are very concerned that maybe I'm, you know, I'm getting ripped off or I don't even know what kind of price I should be paying for this. But it, plywood, is a manufactured product. I know that sounds kind of obvious, but when you manufacture something, there are a series of steps in order to end up with your finished product. And really, they've gotten it down to a science, and it can be pretty easily quantified how much each one of those steps costs, how much the raw materials cost. So when you buy a hardwood ply panel for say, $68, $70 a sheet, and you go back to that yard maybe six months later and you're looking for a similar panel and you get one for $50, something's different. 
there hasn't been any major market change that now everything is that much cheaper. The margins are not that high on lumber products in general, but especially on plywood. And the construction techniques are, have not been revolutionized so much that suddenly you're gonna see a drastic reduction in panel price. Couple of dollars may, all you, may be all you see. Now certainly there have been some tariffs and some regulations levied, but a lot of that falls on actual lumber products. Some of the regulations like CARB 1, CARB 2, TSCA compliance, things like that, haven't really affected um, the price so much because they've been phased in over time. When, when CARB 1 first came out and when the formaldehyde emissions first came out and people started thinking about that, there were some cost changes then as plywood manufacturers had to change over their manufacturing line. They basically had to change their glue formulation and figure out how that was gonna result in, in the, the product they were used to making. And there were some changes there, but this stuff has been going on for a long time. We're talking decades that a lot of this low formaldehyde glue has been in use. So really, when Tosca came along and took the California Air Resources Bureau CARB 1, CARB 2 thing out of California and made it a federal mandate, it really wasn't that big of a deal because most of the manufacturers were already producing a CARB compliant panel. And even though that panel may not be sold in California, maybe it's shipped off to Michigan or shipped to Vermont, it doesn't really make sense to for these manufacturers to have two lines running in parallel, one making a CARB compliant and a non-CARB compliant. The glue to be CARB compliant or now Tosca compliant works just fine, so why not use it across the board? And that's what we've seen over the last decade where this low emission formaldehyde glue has just now in common use. So now the Tosca regulation doesn't really change anything for your North American made panels. Where it's been a bit of an issue is the overseas panels. Certainly the panels we think of as bad quality, a lot of the stuff coming out of Chinese mills, but the same thing applies to the European made panels. Some of the finest marine grade plywood comes out of Europe, out of France specifically. You'll find some really, really great shop plywood, the, the um, eponymous Baltic birch. Yes, everyone thinks of Baltic birch as shop plywood, but it is also an actual brand name. And some of the finest Baltic birch, obviously, is coming out of Finland, coming out of the Baltic region. These panels then had to also be compliant to Tosca. The good news is, is most of them were already there, but they had to go through certification processes and audits and things like that to make sure that the auditing bodies, the NCO, NGOs were saying, yes, they are now Tosca compliant. And there was some paperwork and some growing pains in figuring out what paperwork needs to be in place. But a lot of that is really already figured out or is very close to figured out and is not really affecting the price. So it is very, very, um, shall we say, reliable to say, I paid X dollars for this panel. I want a panel similar to that, so I should be paying the same amount, give or take a couple dollars. And honestly, if you're building furniture or you're using plywood for furniture and, and what you're looking for is a nice stable panel that is of consistent thickness, that is machinable, things like that, you're going to buy a nice hardwood panel for about $70. You may, dependent upon the face grain, dependent upon the, the, the species that you're looking for, you may see some changes up to about $80. But any dramatic deviation from that, there's something different. If suddenly you're paying $100 for a panel, something has happened in the construction process. Likewise, you're paying $40 for a panel, something, a corner has been cut somewhere along the way. And I, I try to kind of hammer this home to people. The price point often dictates the manufacturer. And Chinese plywood is, is, has a real stigma attached to it. And that's because we have gone to China because we're looking for a cheaper product. Certainly labor is a lot cheaper over there, but again, the manufacturing process is the same in China as it is in North America. But many of the North American dealers have said, okay, China, we're gonna go to you for our business. We need you to beat $40 a panel. You know, we can get uh, a shop grade panel for $40 here in North America. We need you to come in lower than that. And the Chinese manufacturers say, okay, we can build you one for 35. No, we need you lower than that. Okay, we can build you one for 27. And you figure, well, you know, oh, it's the labor that's cheaper. That does play into some of it, but it's actually, you would think, a much smaller percentage than, than at, at face value. Really what it comes down to is a corner has been cut on how a face veneer was cut. The grade on the face veneer is lower, how dry that face veneer 
is um, how what the quality control in managing that face veneer. Likewise, the the dryness, the grade, how the the veneer plies in the core were cut, how they are assembled, what kind of glue is used, how is the glue used, the feed rate of that. Um, line as it runs through uh, under the glue rollers or the glue sprayers. All of those things will change the quality of the panel. Obviously, if you speed up the feed rate, it's going to spread the glue thinner. It, you're going to produce more panels per hour, but you're also going to produce panels that might be more prone to delamination. Now, we're going to get into all that in a couple of episodes when we talk about the core. The core will probably be the longest episode because there's most to talk about there. But the point is, we can go to a manufacturer and say, I need you to create a panel that I'm going to be able to buy for $27 a sheet. And most of these manufacturers can figure out a way to do that. Certainly there's a bottom into that and you start, you know, pushing back on your raw material suppliers and saying, look, I've got to meet this price point. I need that face veneer. I need that veneer, that core veneer to be cheaper. And the, all this kind of, um, gamesmanship is going on to get these prices down lower and lower and lower, but it does hit a point where, okay, now you still got to ship it. You still got to get it on the other side of the world. And those things are going to be more subject to market terms. So here again, if you buy a panel previously and have had good luck with it, and it was $60 a sheet, you go and find another one and it's $30 a sheet, more than likely that is an import product and not a North American made product. That may be okay for your particular use, or it may not. So here is the number one thing. Let price be your guide. If you've bought a panel and it was terrible and you paid $40 a sheet for it, you're gonna have to pay more than that to get a better performing panel. There's not gonna be any magic manufacturer that can make that $40 price point and give you a much more stable panel. So let price truly be your guide. Truly, you get what you pay for when it comes to plywood. But maybe even more important than that is what do you need? What are you building and what is important to you? If you are paneling a wall with plywood, well, do you really need a panel that is super flat? Because that's the biggest complaint of a lot of plywood is it, it cups and it turns into a potato chip. Well, if you're just going to use fastener screws, nails or whatever to fasten that down to a stud wall, does it need to be flat? Because you're gonna flatten it out just by fastening it to the studs behind it. Do you need both faces to look pretty? No, because one of those faces is gonna to go to the studs and the only thing that's gonna see it is the insulation or the electrical cable. So really all you need is one decent face. Well, are you then going to do something over top of that face? Maybe you're gonna paint it. Maybe you're gonna apply a feature wall or something like that. So you don't need a good face at all. You, you, it doesn't matter. So you have to think about what is important to you and whatever application you're using it for. Then when you go to your dealer and you say, I need to buy some plywood and I'm gonna need 20 sheets of plywood. They'll say, well, what plywood do you want? Well, here's what I need. I don't really need it to be super flat. I don't really need it to be machinable. All I'm doing is just throwing it up against the wall. I want it to be, you know, I'm gonna paint it or I'm gonna put a feature over or, or something over top of it, clad over top of it. So I do want a relatively flat face. I don't want anything telegraphing through under the face veneer. Or maybe I don't. Maybe I'm gonna put, you know, some solid wood uh, shiplap over top of that and I just need a good structure I can nail into anywhere. These are all things that affect the type of panel you're looking for. Say you're building furniture. Well, now you do need something that's gonna stay a little bit more flat. You do need something that you can be able to cut joinery into and not have it fall apart. So the amount of voids in the core are gonna be an important thing. You don't wanna be cutting um, a rabbit on the end and have that rabbit be pockmarked with voids and it suddenly starts to chew it apart as you run it across the table saw or you saw it. The voids and the, the um, consistency of the core is particularly important. Or say you're building furniture in a modern factory using CNC. Well, one of the biggest issues with plywood and CNC is the lack of consistent thickness. When you throw that sheet onto the CNC bed, if the thickness varies from one end of the sheet to the other, that can cause real problems. Now, some CNCs are smart enough to, to accommodate for that, but others really have issues with this. And this can come down to a consistent thickness of each ply in the veneer and a consistent thickness in the face veneer. So when the whole thing is pressed together, if there's inconsistencies there, or if there are instabilities in the panel caused by a variety of things, which we'll get into in future episodes, those can um, 
telegraph up to the surface or even possibly collapse over time where you get the center of the panel is actually thinner than the outsides or, or the opposite where the outsides, the edges of the panel are thinner than the center. This can be a real problem when you're dealing with the incredible precision of a CNC machine. So there are going to be kind of showstoppers for whatever application you are using and you need to figure out or at least work with your dealer to figure out those things that absolutely must be met. This panel must be flat um, and, and really must be flat is, is kind of a relative term, relative term, flat over what kind of distance. Going back to the furniture idea, say you're making um, you know, uh, kitchen cabinets. Well, your base cabinet is gonna be maybe 36 inches high and about 24 inches deep. So the largest panel you're gonna have is 24 by 36. You know, that's a, a quarter of a typical four by eight sheet panel. Well, a little bit more than a quarter, obviously. Um, no, sorry, it's less than a quarter. I can do math, really. So think about that. If you, you look at that four by eight sheet panel and you go, oh yeah, you can see there's a cup in there and there's a bow along the length, but now divide that into quarters cut that panel up into quarters and how bowed and cupped is that two by three panel really? You'll find that the bow is actually quite a bit less. Moreover, when you actually screw that panel together with rails and styles and backer boards and things like that, can you actually pull that cup out just by the internal structures that are going into actually making the cabinet? Maybe, maybe not, but here again, is something that needs to be considered for how flat that panel needs to be. Anytime you're going to be fastening that panel to something else, one of the great things about plywood is it is quite elastic. It does have a fair amount of bendability to it. Going back to our previous episode, when we talk about stiffness and bending strength, you'll find that the numbers in plywood are substantially lower than that of, of um, solid wood which by the way is why a product like lumber core plywood or blockboard plywood exists because it's much, much stiffer using a, a thicker core of solid lumber. It allows it to be a lot stiffer. It's got a, a, a stiffness number much, much higher than your typical plywood panel. Kind of going off on a tangent there, but it's something to think about. The beauty of this plywood is you can kind of manipulate it and force it into flat by at fastening it, adhering it to a, a skeleton, a substructure. Going back to my first uh, example of using, say, cladding a wall, you know, is that wall perfectly flat? Probably not. You know, most home builders recognize there's nothing flat and there's nothing square. So you are scribing angles and, and scribing ends and essentially screwing things down to whatever you have and any flatness that, um, uh, out of flatness, I sh should say, is taken up joint by joint. But maybe, maybe you're paneling a very large area and you're going with kind of a modern look and you need to have uh, open seams where it needs to be flush across those seams. Well, now if you've got panels that are inconsistent in thickness from one panel to the other and you screw those down, you go right up to that seam and you see, oh, this looks terrible because I've got, I've got a reveal. I've got maybe a 30 second of an inch where this panel is fatter than the other one. So there again is a specification, a showstopper that is important to you. I also see a lot in large feature walls where steel is used, and maybe there's a frame uh, of steel, a very Im immovable object, and the plywood has to fit in there, and it has to create an equal reveal because the steel itself is dictating that reveal. So you're going to have to go to your dealer and say, okay, I have a reveal, I have a, a socket or a pocket that the panel's gonna fit into, and it is you know, five eighths of an inch deep. And, or it's an inch deep, but I wanna have a quarter inch reveal, you know, where the steel is proud of the panel. So I need to have an actual three quarter inch thick panel and all of the panels that I buy have to be three quarters of an inch. That is a specification that has to be met. That is a specification that will help your dealer determine which plywood product do I have that I can sell to this customer. Or more importantly, how can I go to my distributor, my manufacturer, and say, okay, I have a customer that must, must, must have each panel to be exactly three quarters of an inch thick. There can't be variance from one to another, there can't be variance across the thickness, et cetera, across the width, rather. That's really, really important. You know, the other things 
uh, uh, the grade of the veneer, the, the, the face and the back. And plywood is generally graded, at least hardwood plywood, is graded on the face veneers. You can buy an AB panel or an AC panel. And that means the front face is an A grade, the top grade veneer. The back face is a C grade obviously a lesser grade. There are more defects allowable in that. There could be possible football patches and things like that in there. Or if you're buying something like shop plywood, what a lot of people often refer to as Baltic birch, it's generally a C panel, a CC or a CD as in dog panel, because it's not really meant to be a show surface or it's being used in a shop and maybe you're gonna paint it or maybe you're just gonna leave it natural. Which brings me to my other point because I get a lot of people asking about Baltic birch. Yes, Baltic birch is a type of plywood, but it's also a brand name. You're better off if you're going to a dealer and you're looking for a birch ply, ask for shop plywood or cabinet grade plywood. This is what in the, the lion's share of people are using in things like industrial cabinets, kitchen cabinets that might then be skinned with something else based upon the, the you know, who barbers kitchen you're building, the homeowner saying, I want cherry. So you, you use a, a cabinet grade plywood and then you skin it or you have it laid up with cherry. Um, that, that's kind of the biggest misnomer and for a lot of woodworkers who are using plywood to build their shop jigs and things like that, you want to buy shop grade plywood. But again, there's going to be some deviation or not deviation, some variance from one manufacturer of shop plywood to another. And personally, I think the true Baltic birch, the Finnish stuff made in Finland manufactories is the finest quality out there. It's got the most consistency. It's got the highest grade of birch that's being used. And if say, say you're building uh, a crosscut sled or a shooting board, this is something that's going to be a relatively small uh, cut out from that large panel and you want that to be flat not only flat but flat all on its own in other words I'm not taking that panel and screwing it down to something else that it can conform to whatever that substructure is this crosscut sled has to ride on my super precisely flat table saw top and it, it doesn't it's not going to rock on me you know, because if it rocks, well, that could cause binding at the blade. So it's really important that I have a high quality shop plywood. I have a shop plywood that's going to be really, really flat. And you need to tell your dealer that. And the dealer's gonna say, well, I've got a shop plywood here that's $45 a sheet, and I've got a shop plywood that's $60 a sheet. More than likely, you're gonna want the one that's $60 a sheet, but then ask them, well, what, what's the difference between that $40 and $60 sheet? You know, and if they don't know, which let's be honest, that could be very common. There's a lot, most plywood manufacturers make a large range of products meeting a variety of price points. And the, the salesman for that mill has sold to the retailer or to another distributor and they've sold them a variety of products and the salesperson that maybe you're dealing with behind the desk at your, your local retailer may not actually know all the differences, but they at least can grab a spec sheet from the manufacturer and say, okay, well, this panel comes from Columbia Forest Products or this is a state's industry panel and they can pull up the spec sheet from them and say, okay, here's the $45 sheet and they can tie it back to inventory numbers and figure out, okay, this is model number X1, you know, and this is model number Y2. And you can at least then look at the spec sheets. And these are all out there for the most places, most part, you can go and download spec sheets from most of the websites and see the various differences between one panel to the other. But you'll also find, say, you know, a company like Columbia Forest Products may have, we're talking shop plywood here, may have like eight different products that they would consider to be shop plywood or birch ply. And the differences from one panel to the other may not be immediately recognizable to the eye. And really the difference may be the price point. And there will be subtle things, tiny little things that are different, maybe the species or the grade of the species that's used in the core, or was that uh, each veneer ply, was it sanded before it was put into the, the glue and the press? You know, how many times was it sanded before it was put in? All of these things are gonna affect the stability of that panel. And those things may not be readily apparent in that spec sheet, but here again, price point is gonna dictate it for you. So. This is gonna be somewhat of a shorter episode from my normal stuff because I don't wanna to go too much into the veneer and the core construction. I want those to be their own episodes. But let me just kind of sum up by saying, check out the price. And when you, when you talk to the dealer and say, I'm looking for, we're just gonna stick with the, the birch ply example. I'm looking for shop plywood. What do you have? Okay, well, here it is and it's $46 a sheet. Okay, do you have any other shop plywood at another price point? 
you know, oh, you need more expensive or cheaper? No, I'm just curious what else you have. Oh, okay, well, we have one that's $30, and we have one that's $60, and we have one that's $70. Okay, well, is the, where's the $30 one come from? Well, that's an import, comes from China. Okay, generally, this is my opinion, but it's also my opinion born on looking at a lot of panels. I don't like import plywood. If I need some precision, if I'm cladding a wall, Chinese maple plywood is great. In fact, the walls in my shop right now are clad with a maple import panel. Comes from a Chinese mill, works just fine for the purposes that I need it because I don't need a highly, you know, uh, consistent panel in thickness. I don't need a really pretty face veneer, and none of the edges are going to be seen, so any voids in there don't really matter. But that's really where that lower price point is going to come from. So if I'm looking for something to make shop jigs and appliances, um, well, then I'm going to look at that price point range and go, well, 30 is not going to be good. Really don't want to buy an import panel of precision and ultra flatness is important. The other thing I will say is a panel may be flat, but just like solid lumber, sometimes when you saw it into smaller parts, it will start to cup and bow on you, or you'll see tension released in the board. The same thing can actually happen with plywood. So a four by eight sheet um, may look relatively flat, and that may just be an artifact that it was banded and, and dead stacked under heavy weight, and it's just kind of holding a memory. Once you actually start cutting into smaller parts, some of the inconsistencies in the veneer layers and the voids and the, the dryness issues may start to rear their ugly head and cause those smaller parts to start to cup and move around on you. So you, you have to think about this stuff. Um, so again, if I were faced with buying shot plywood and I need something that's super flat to build my crosscut sled and my dealer says I've got $30, $40 and a $60 panel, I'm gonna buy the $60 panel because that table saw crosscut sled, I'm gonna use that thing for like the next five, 10 years. And every time I use it, if it's warped and it's causing binding, not only is it gonna be a pain in the butt to get precision cuts, but it's gonna be downright dangerous, possibly causing binding and kickback on my table saw. So the extra $20 I'm gonna spend on that sheet is worth its weight in gold. Certainly worth its weight of a finger you might lose while working at the table saw. So ask your dealers, what they have, you know, start with shop plywood, or I'm looking for a cherry uh, plywood panel. Yes, we have cherry, great. What, how many, you know, you just have one product, you have two products, what are the price points? Start from there and, you know, if you can, skew towards the higher end. Now certainly you're gonna run into panels that are really expensive. Getting to 150, 250, I've seen $380 a sheet for certain products. There's a lot of other stuff going on there that more than likely is not gonna be what you need. Or maybe it is. Maybe you've got a really, really specific thing where you need, you know, a riffs on cross banded face out of walnut. I've done that before. That costs three hundred and seventy dollars for that one sheet. There's a very, very specific reason for that. This goes back to again, what do you need? How are you going to use it? What's important to you? And that will totally dictate where you go. So start with that. That basic. I need a cherry plywood panel. I need shop grade plywood. How many different products do you have in that line? What are their price points? Okay, great. Here's what's really important to me. It needs to be flat. I'm gonna be cutting out 24 by 24 panels or 24 by 36 panels or 12 by 12 panels and I'm not fastened with anything else, so they need to be flat. Or what's really important to me is I'm gonna actually be cutting joinery into this. I'm gonna cut dovetails into the end of my plywood or mortise and tenons or rabbits or whatever. So I need to make sure there's no voids so that when I start cutting the joinery, things start to crumble apart or I'm ending up with inconsistent joinery. That's really one of the things about shop plywood that is that is a, the nicer stuff is not gonna have those voids. It's gonna have a very consistent feel that almost can be machined like solid wood. So just being able to share that with your dealer will really guide you into what you're looking for. And you're also gonna very quickly identify a dealer that just really doesn't specialize in plywood. And they just don't know, they, they don't know. But you know what, they might be able to get what you need. So if at least if you can characterize exactly what you need and it's exactly what's important to you, they can then go back to their supplier and say, look, this is what I need. And maybe they can get it from somewhere else. The last thing I will say about this, that's the unfortunate thing. Plywood, again, it's a manufactured product. Plywood is not cheap. It's big, right? It's not cheap to ship around. It really doesn't make sense to be moving plywood one sheet at a time. So a lot of the higher end stuff, the specialty type stuff, really is only available unless you're buying it in bulk, unless you're buying it by the bunk. And dependent upon the manufacturer and the weight of the panel, but that could be 10 sheets, that could be 50 sheets in a bunk. 
This can be really frustrating to the weekend woodworker, to the small shop, cabinet shop, that only needs five sheets or one sheet. And a lot of times you are severely limited by what you can buy just because you only need one sheet. It's a fact of life, unfortunately. If you find yourself running into that situation and you need a very specific panel that's just not available at your local dealer, I would recommend reaching out to cabinet shops or reaching out to a wholesaler that does carry it, but maybe they won't sell it to you because they won't just sell one panel at a time. Ask them, who are they selling it to? Who can I call that is selling this that you, maybe you just sold uh, you know, 25, 30, 100 sheets to this guy. Can I then call them and say, look, I was just talking to you know, this wholesaler. I understand you bought some plywood from me lately. Could I buy a sheet off of you? And you'd be surprised how far that will go. There's a lot of cabinet shops, a lot of millwork houses, a lot of furniture makers, um, large commercial furniture makers that are buying a great deal of plywood. And they may be able to sell you a single sheet. Or you can always get together with a bunch of your friends and say, you know, you buy five sheets and your friend buys five sheets and their friend buys five sheets. And suddenly you've got an order of 25 sheets, 30 sheets of plywood. And most of these uh, wholesalers are going to talk to you at that level. And you may have a little bit more ability to buy some higher end or some specialty type pieces of plywood. So price be your guide. Absolutely know what you need in that panel and be able to um, explain be able to, to tell the dealer why you need that. Not just, this is what I need. Um, wh why is that important? How are, what are you gonna be making? That's gonna really, really help that sales guy figure out the type of product for you. Okay, as you can tell, there's a lot to talk about with plywood. So next week, um, well, next episode, whenever that comes out, is gonna be really focusing on face veneers. So tune in, and we're gonna talk face veneers. As always, folks, go buy some lumber. That could be plywood, too. 